Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us Across the Fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. With winter behind us and warmer weather settling in, it's time once again to begin our seasonal gardening and landscape programs. We've called on our experts from the University of Vermont to get things going. Joining me are UVM horticulturalist Leonard Perry and Ann Hazelrig, who heads up the university's Plant Diagnostic Clinic. Great to have you both <laughs> with, us, with us and great to be talking about the outdoors spring. again. Oh, yes, spring. it is. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yay. Um, so, Leonard, what are some ways that gardeners can, can get ready for the season? Well, it's just so much. It's like where to begin. And I'm still working on last year, but of right. course, <laughs> most people know our winter came early. I didn't get that cleanup done, so I'm still right. working on the cleanup. Meanwhile, everything <coughs> else is starting to grow. I'm getting behind on the seed sowing. That's another thing people could be doing. Sure. So I'm going to probably be doing a lot more shopping this year for those plants that and didn't get a chance to start. So again, early shopping to get the best varieties. But the other thing you can do is order bulbs. Oh. People are thinking, why now? It's like you plant those in the fall. Well, right. they do. All the good, the catalogs are coming out now and all the good deals. Uh, I just I love spring bulbs because after a long winter, nothing talks spring to me more than all these bulbs. So I brought a few pictures today of some daffodils, some of the more common ones. Of course, Great. most people know the trumpet daffodil. Um, and this has a, you know, the daffodils have the cup in the middle. Mm -hmm. And this one ha is longer than the petals on the outside. So that's the, what makes it the trumpet. And they're uh -huh. uh, somewhat tall. A Dutch master, that's a very common one that you may find. Of course, a large cup, that little cup in the middle is a bit smaller, you know, and a bit shorter. Um, it's uh, over a third the length of those outer petals, um, but not quite as long as. And then there's the small cup with even shorter, uh, less than a third the length of the petals. And those can be in, as you see here, a contrasting color, yellow and can have different colored rims to them and they, they tend to be a little shorter. This is flower record example right. of that type of daffodil. And then the tazettas are a little bit different. They have several um, flowers per stalk and you can see very uh, small cups on those. Uh, but the others usually have one flower per stalk. These ha can have several, so those are nice. Uh, geranium, that's a very common cultivar of that. And then the poeticas, this is an heirloom. They've been around for many, you know, centuries really, and uh, they have a very tiny cup. Sometimes that's you know, often bicolor, might be orange or yellow with a red rim around it. Uh, very small, these, these tend to have some fragrance and several flowers per stem. So yeah, just a beautiful. lot to choose from when you're <laughs> seeing those catalogs. Order now, you get some really good deals. Of course, they'll come in the falls when you plant these. Okay, but you order now. Cause this <laughs> oh, is, yeah, this is you can you order later ones. or you can buy them in the fall, <laughs> but you can get some really good deals now. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> and you also brought a hummingbird feeder. It's about that time. The hummingbirds it, are coming north, and um, so it's time to get the feeders out. And I've tried all these various feeders. The two I found they really like. This is a more recent one I've tried. It sits on a window, has a little uh, couple of suction clamps huh. you, or you put on there. And they will come right to that window and go in these holes and you just <laughs> put the food in. It's just amazing and to see them that close. Yeah, there's not much that's red out right now. Right. So this might be the first thing exactly they find. Exactly that. And then this red feeder here. Um, I've, again, I've tried a lot of different ones. This is uh, kind of a little improved one. These you can take off. They're easy to clean. Um, but they're just a standard hummingbird feeder. Um, you just screw this off and you can put the solution in. Now for the food, you, you know, you can see it for sale. And, but you don't want to use the food coloring. You can make it at home very simple. One part sugar, four parts water. So a cup of sugar, a uh, quart of water basically. I make it up, keep it in the fridge, and every few days, you know, clean the feeder and refill it. But, you know, they're coming north and it's amazing to watch that. And there's some websites, a couple of websites out there you can uh, go to and see. On uh, April 17th, I noticed they were um, actually up, you know, into Massachusetts, oh. southern New England. <laughs> Uh, that's the middle of April. But usually I figure about the first week of May they're coming to my home back. And so I want to have these up ready for them ready. because they made that trip from Central America. And again, you can see on April 17th how, you know, they're starting to see some spots. And they, again, there's a couple of these sites, uh, Hummingbird Central and journeynorth.org. Uh, you can see those. And then 
Um, so, so they're that's how, how, how close yeah, they how, are, what, that they've been spotted already. It's it, amazing, their journey is so long. It is, and you can actually go birds. on there, and it, when you see one, you can actually record your observation too, which is kind of cool, so yeah. I've <laughs> never done that. But I do track that, so I know when they're getting close, so I want to make sure these feeders are out in the food, because they really need that energy. They've traveled from, a lot of these from Central America. So get them out now, things. get yeah. them out now, and no food coloring, because the red does exactly. that. Exactly, that it? does that, mm -hmm. they just need the, the sugary solution to help them get the energy that they then use to catch the insects, which is really what, what they're about for their right, diet. <laughs> right, right. Thank you so much for that. Those are great <laughs> tips. So, um, so, and you kind of deal with the not so nice part of the garden and, and landscaping. Yeah. So what kinds of diseases or other problems should we think about this time of year? Yeah, well, Leonard was mentioning uh, seed starting and a lot of gardeners are starting their seeds this year, uh, you know, in this time in the spring. And one of the biggest problems that gardeners run into is a series of root rots called damping off. So I have a slide of, of what that looks like, but, but basically, um, Seeds just sort of, the seedlings kind of fall over. Oh, sure. Yeah, That's and it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's caused by four or five different soil-borne fungi, and there are ways you can sort of avoid this. All those fungi love cool, wet conditions, so anything you can do to keep your soils on the drier side mm -hmm. as the seedlings are coming up, and also keeping the soils warm. Uh, I've got a, um, one thing you should do before you start your seedlings is if you reuse your seedling flats, which is mm -hmm. great, mm -hmm. make sure you soak them in a, a weak bleach solution to right, kill yeah. any of those overwintering pathogens and get the soil off. This is mm -hmm. a tub that I took a picture of in the UVM greenhouse. This is how they <laughs> st sterilize it. Yeah, but you can do it on a smaller level. Sure. Um, and then the other thing you can do is pick a good seedling mix. Don't use mm. soil from your garden. It's too heavy and wet. Mm. So pick a germinating mix that's light, uh, that's gonna not uh, harbor these pathogens. It's sterile. Um, the other thing gardeners can use is a heating mat. So anything you can do to get those seedlings up quickly to sort of outrun any of those soil-borne pathogens will help. And these are uh, for sale you know, at any so gardening you store. So you right, right under your flats. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then would you use a spray bottle rather than just so you're, it's a light, watering yeah it's not you could or just trying to water just the soil you don't really want to water the leaves but okay. just keeping it warm and on the drier side is the best thing you can do okay any other seasonal things to think about uh well yeah Probably many we'll, but yeah <laughs> i think we'll talk about some cold issues too right. we'll, yeah so so what do, what do we do about this? so we're ready it's warm we want to buy those plants and get them right out there. We yeah, well, we there is a problem with, uh, you know, we all want to get out in the garden. We've grown these uh, like tomato seedlings and things. And really, we tend to jump the gun on when to put them out. You know, the soils are still pretty cold in, in May. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of uh, gardeners run into cold injury in um, their seedlings, that purpling on the tomato uh, seedling, that's an indication of um, the anthocyanins oh. come out. They, they're not moving nutrients as easily, so they turn purple. Also, if you mm. look at that young seedling, people get very concerned. They see those older leaves looking bad and they think it's a disease. But that plant is just putting all of its energy into the new growth. Uh -huh. So you don't get too concerned if those seed leaves look bad and yellow. As long as that new growth looks good, your seedlings are fine. But I think the um, best thing to do, here's another in, uh, picture of cold injury. It can cause all sorts of weird things like spotting and uh, it looks like an infectious disease, but it's not. Always look at that brand new growth. And if you've got mm -hmm. good new growth, your seedlings, are they'll be fine. But I think the bottom line is, is don't jump the gun, put things out you know, first week in June, like we were talking about. <laughs> I always want to do it. I mean, just have to keep telling myself first week in June is fine. Yeah, because otherwise <laughs> you put them out early, they're just going to sort of sit still in those cold soils anyway. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, terrific advice. Um, so, you know, another thing, Leonard, is there's a, there's a pest that's out there when we're outdoors that is uh, growing in population, and it's a real problem and a danger. Ticks. And Ticks. as we've talked about them before, <laughs> I just brought a couple of examples today of some repellents. Uh, suggestions mm -hmm. um, to follow up on. We mentioned these before, but it's worth mentioning again. Sure. Um, of course, they're uh, 
ones you can buy. These are ones you can buy. Permethrin on clothes is really good. That's one of the best for uh, not only repelling but killing ticks. Mm. Or DEET or a picket or den on uh, skin. Compounds that contain those. You don't like the DEET or allergic to that. A picker den is actually originally from pepper plants, permethrin originally from uh, mum plants. A uh, mm. combination of those is the most effective. It's actually what the uh, Department of Defense recommends wow. and uses. Okay. If you don't like any of those, you can actually <laughs> use some essential herb oils like rosemary, lemongrass, geranium. You can find products with these. Uh, garlic oil um, works as well. So look for those in products. But if you do get ticks, uh, have a tick removal tool. You can get these mm. at uh, drugstores. They're really uh, inexpensive. And all you do is if you have a tick, you just put that on your skin. It's very narrow there. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea is to just uh, lift it off. Lift it off. You don't, you don't twist. Yeah, you, you don't. don't twist. You don't try to burn okay. it off or agitate it because then it'll just put more toxin in you. So Okay. <laughs> okay. And always check yourself. Always, always check, check yourself, too. Yourself. So there are a couple of garden tours that you also want to uh, Yes, I have a couple. Uh, the one this summer is full, unfortunately fortunately for people <laughs> out there. So um, uh, the July garden tour, but September still has a few seats to Montreal Botanic Garden. So you can go on my website, perrysperennials.info, look under the garden tours, and if you're interested, sign up quick uh, for one of those seats okay. uh, to Montreal, September 16th. Awesome. <laughs> and Anne, if people have gardening and landscape questions? Yeah, the first call? stop is always the Master Gardener Helpline. They're a great resource. They're housed in my lab, and they can help you um, answer most of your gardening questions. It's such a great resource to yeah, have that. Yeah, it is. And, and there's always somebody on the other yeah, end of the exactly. line. Yeah, exactly. Which is fantastic. Yeah. Well, uh, Leonard and Anne, thank you so much sure. for getting us ready and <laughs> psyched for the season. We'll get out our feeders yeah. and, uh, and be careful with our plants. Thank you very much. Yeah. And thank you for joining us Across the Fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. Yeah.